Okay, so the web was marked off chain. How does it work? So here, so let's, let's take a toy model of uh, five websites pointing to each other and try to see um, how we would um, understand this particular collection of websites. Let a piece of U be the probability of reaching node U from node B. So for example, how do you reach node A from node B? Well, you either you must have come along this path, but what's the probability that you ended up there? Well, there are only two paths coming out of B, so the probability is a half. What's the probability of you ending up at A if you were website C? Well, there are only three edges coming out of C, so the probability is one third. What's the probability that you were sitting at E and now ended up at A? Well, it's zero because there's nothing in between. So you get these transition probabilities there. And you set up a, what's called a transition matrix in the, in the theory of Markov chains. The rows and columns are uh, labeled after the vertices, and then the, the UV entry would be the problem of reaching known U from the UV. Observe that the columns add up to one. That's because the probabilities, uh, the probability of reaching some node from you standing at one node and you're going to be going out into some other thing, so the probabilities you have to add up to one. So that's column probabilities that have to add up to one. And that's what's called a column stochastic matrix. So the, this particular fact tells the P transpose has eigenvalue one with eigenvector being given by the column one, 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 one. Let's keep that in mind. So, if a web user is on page C, what will she do after one click, after two clicks, after n clicks? So this is how Markov would describe the process. You have your website, you're on page, website C, we will indicate that by the column vector 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And after one click, you will Take your zero, your vector 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and hit it with the transition matrix, and then you'll get a list of probabilities. The probability that you're at the first website is one half, the second is one third, and so on and so forth. So you get so you, the transition matrix, having the transition matrix in your hand allows you to not really do any calculation. So if you've got your website, you're on the third website, where am I going to be after one click? Well, it's not a deterministic thing, it's, it will give you a bunch of probabilities. It's, you know, there are lots of possibilities from where you are, right? You can go in various directions. So it gives you these probabilities here. And so after two clicks, you just hit the thing with the, matrix, the transition matrix one more time. So P squared. So you get a bunch of probabilities here. And after three clicks, after n clicks, it's clear what to do. So after n steps, you're going to hit your column vector uh, by P to the N. In other words, I need to calculate the nth power of the transition matrix if I have to figure out where I will be. Or do I? Let's just see. Looks like a lot of matrix multiplication. So the theory of eigenvectors and eigenvalues will simplify life and show us that we really don't need to do all that work. Um, so you all know what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. Um, so the study of such objects is linear algebra old. So here, let's look at our eigenvectors and eigenvalues for the matrix P. Notice that P and P transpose have the same characteristic problem, and therefore they have the same eigenvalues. They may not have the same eigenvectors, but they have the same eigenvalues. Um, and we observed already that P transpose has eigenvalue 1, therefore P has to have eigenvalues. The theorem of Frobenius concerning such matrices is the following. All the eigenvalues of the transition matrix P have absolute value less than equal to 1. And then there exists an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 1 having all non-negative entries. That's all it is. So this theorem was the theorem of the, the Stanford professor was lecturing on. When Google Voice was sitting there, he realized that then this particular idea has been called the $25 billion eigenvector. <laughs> so that's the linear algorithm. 
So it's a nice article that I would recommend people to read. Appeared in 19, um, sorry, 2006. Can't be because we've got 2001 when the movement started. 2006 was when this paper appeared. Okay. So Perron's theorem is a refinement, which I want. I don't want to go into the detail. There's a small refinement of, of this theorem that you need to actually put this into application. So I will state it here for now and then and show one more refinement that I, I really don't need, but uh, we do need it in the actual actual practice. So these are the theorems of uh, Perron's theorem. So let's go back and understand why these theorems are important. We'll make the following assumptions about the matrix P, that P has exactly one eigenvalue with absolute value 1. The corresponding eigenspace will assume has dimension 1. P is diagonalizable, but it's eigenvectors for the base. <coughs> and under these hypotheses, there's a unique eigenvector B, that the P B equals B. There's no name dimension to total for these. For well, B is a theorem together with A implies that all the other eigenvalues are absolute value strictly less than one. So in your transition matrix, there's only one eigenvalue one, and everybody else is strictly less than one. That's a really important point. Because that's going to help us calculate the nth power of the transition matrix. But then let's see how you do that. So keep that, that some of the groups, uh, some of the columns of one. Let's try to compute P to the n P0. And let's take that toy case where only five vertices were there. Okay. So here you have five vertices. Let's say that P, the eigenvectors of P, uh, we have a basis of eigenvectors, V1 and V5. And let V1 be the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 1. You write your vector in terms of the like, uh, you write your typical vector P0 in terms of these basis vectors. And a simple calculation, which I can do right here, shows that A1 has to be 1. So if we're keeping in mind that J was that, ve that vector of all the degrees 1, was an eigenvector for the transpose, you can use that, and you can see that um, A1 has to be 1. Okay, so I'll skip the proof here. So that's the sense of the proof. And once you have that, you can now go back to the calculation and now that I know that A1 is 1, I don't put it there. But then the other vectors are there. So now when I hit it with the, uh, P to the M, I get this equation. And because these Vi's are eigenvectors corresponding to eigenvalues of lambda i, you get lambda 2 to the M, V2, lambda 5 to the M, V5 for the other ones. But the, but the theorem of Frobenius tells you that all the other eigenvalues are strictly less than 1. So the nth power goes to zero. So if you're after 50 clicks, where's the person going to be? Pretty close to V1. <coughs> Practically V1. So that eigenvector V1 corresponding to the eigenvalue V1 uh, is giving you the ranking of all the websites according to their definition of importance. So that's what's spit out by your Google search. So, as I said, since the eigenvalues are absolute values strictly less than 1, we see that P to the n, P0 goes to D1 and then Moral, it doesn't matter what P0 is. It doesn't matter where you are. So if, if, I, if I've got a, if I have a Google query, search word, I put it in, punch it in, and I end up getting 50 websites that have this particular word in it. Now I want to rank those websites according to importance. You take that subgraph, Take that graph and the connections between those 50 websites, you create this matrix, you calculate the eigen um, vector corresponding to the eigenvalue 1, and that eigenvector is the rank because of this theorem. This is the Markov process. The Markov process says that it doesn't matter what P0 is, the stationary vector is the limit. And, and this theorem is actually at the heart of many, many applications in biology. The, the, the transmission of disease, how does it, it work by a Markov process? The migration of populations, Markov process. Anything, you know, there are lots and lots of movements and changes that take place, so Markov processes are really at the heart of you, uh, you know, applicable mathematics in many uh, relevant contexts in society today. So this is just one case in point. 
So returning to our example, when you do the calculation, it turns out that the eigenvector corresponding to icon number one turns out to be one of these, both being on the third. You divide by 41 to normalize the measure of the probabilities, and that gives you the rank of B, A, C, C, D. That's, and that's what's spit out. And of course, the computer can do this really rather very fast, and it spits it out. The old search engines, if you were around 30 years ago, and you were using these search engines, there was all the list of them, there was LIFO, there was Yahoo, and so on and so forth. What they do is they just take the search word, go find the stuff, and just dump it. So Google, all it realizes, you take that stuff, rank it, and, and the ranking is done on a markup process. So is there a way that I can find the ranking of Facebook or the Pardon me? Find the ranking how important it is. Can you find the ranking of some particular website on the website? Say for the price of one. Is there a way that you find the ranking? Oh, yeah, there probably is. Then we have to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, keeping in mind the ranking is relative to the search word. You see, the search word that you put in determines the website that it collects. And then it proceeds to this process. It means there must be some ways to improve. Oh yeah, that's the whole point of my yes, talk. Yes. That's my, that's the point of my talk. Yeah, yes. Exactly. So you got it. You got it right. So um, that's it. I mean, you will see the, the by understanding how Google works, you will see the positive side and also the negative side. And there's quite a bit of negative side of Google. That's what I'm trying to put it. So if you have, if you get a bunch of friends, they start websites and they keep on pointing to you. You can sabotage. That's what companies are doing. So now we can trust what Google spits out. So there's some improved page trends which I will discuss. We'll talk about loops and whatnot. Uh, let me just get out of that. Okay. Let me now move on in uh, 20 more minutes. So we'll talk about radio surgery and the mathematics of shapes. So um, here we're going to discuss um, the mathematical question of what is a shape in the context of search and why it's important. So what is gamma like surgery? It's surgery without actually making any cuts. You don't actually cut the human being. Uh, it's non-invasive medical procedure to treat tumors usually in the brain. And this is called radiosurgery, since it uses radiation to perform the surgery. 201 cobalt, that's the isotope, Gamma ray beams are arrayed in a high hemisphere and aimed through a collimator to a common focal point. So there's the focal point, and they're aimed by this particular helmet. And the patient's head is positioned so that the tumor is the focal point. So here's the picture of that helmet. And it actually turns into a minimax problem. The tumor may be irregular in shape, spread over a region. The idea is to minimize the number of radiation treatments and maximize the area that's been treated. So when the beams are focused with the help of a helmet, they produce focal regions of various sizes, and each size of the dose requires a different helmet. And so the helmet needs to be changed, and when the dose radius needs to be changed, and unfortunately the helmet weighs 500 pounds, uh, it's, it's important to minimize the number of uh, helmet changes. So this is what began an interesting topic called the mathematics of shapes. Of course, the mathematics of shapes has been around. The French geometry has been around for a long time. But it applied to this context really took off in the 1950s and 60s. So here's the tumor. Okay, so there's the tumor. And you want to hit it with various treatments. So here's the target area on which the radiation should be applied. And the elements have very, very different focal regions. So uh, let's see how one treatment would work. So you cover that, you know, when the treatment is given, it covers only a sphere. It doesn't give odd shapes, right? So you, you get, you maximize the sphere that you can pack in into that particular spot. And then you give one more treatment. Kind of cover up a little bit more of that thing. Notice, by the way, after one treatment, the shape has changed. After the second treatment, the shape has changed. So you have to do recalibration each time to see how the problem is going to work. So one more treatment, and more or less you cut everything. So three treatments, and <coughs> practically done. Just to be a, it depends on how much you want it left, uh, you want the uh, tumor to remain. 
that can be actually handled by the antibodies of the body. So this is what, what's called the threshold. So it turned into a mathematical problem, which is a kind of a different kind of sphere packing. Before, the classical sphere packing problem is you have all the same size spheres, and you're just packing that into the regions. But here, you have different size spheres, and you want to pack it in such a way that the, left, the parts that are not covered by the spheres is only a small fraction of the total volume. And so the problem can be formulated very mathematically in this fashion that is described. The volume of the region minus the volume of the spheres should be a small proportion of the total volume. That's it. So it's a minimax pro uh, packing problem. So uh, in order to understand where to end the laser beam, um, the notion of a skeleton of a shape had to be introduced in mathematics. And so this skeleton of a shape uh, to understand it, let's begin with some simple two-dimensional uh, skeletons. So supposing you have a uh, region, let me take the picture here, that's the technical definition. Supposing you have a region here, the um, skeleton of this particular region is defined as the locus of points in that region with the property that if I have, if I have a point and I can put a sphere, uh, sorry, a circle in this case, a circle that will touch the boundary in at least two points. Okay, so that's the definition of a point of the skeleton. So here it is. A collection of points is forms the skeleton if it touches the boundary in at least two points. And, and it doesn't go over that. It's still inside the region. And that's what you end up in the, in the, in the last example in, in trying to calculate the skeleton of this particular region. Uh, using this definition, you end up getting this kind of one-dimensional curve piece of paper inside that. Okay, so, that's, so here's another example of uh, you, tr you basically take your gradient and see that cuts the, the boundary at two points. And there's some theorems that you can prove about how to calculate skeletons of regions in a very efficient manner. And you can put this all into a computer and crank it up with an algorithm. So uh, some simple skeletons, for example, if the shape was very simple, like a triangle, the skeleton is exactly what you think it is. It's the bisector of that particular angle. The skeleton of a, a horizontal thing <coughs> is just a line in the line of middle, because it satisfies those properties that you can put a uh, circle and it touches the boundary two points at least. In these cases, it's exactly two points. And when you try to calculate the skeleton of a box, <coughs> or, or a rectangle rather in this case, uh, this is what you get. So if, uh, if these were the only two points there, for using the previous example, you can see that the skeleton will have to contain this line segment. And then but the fact is that there's this boundary and this boundary on the other two sides, and therefore <coughs> the skeleton change, and that's the skeleton. The skeleton is that inside uh, piecewise uh, continuous uh, curve. <clears throat> so given a region in R2, we did want to determine the skeleton since the center will be the focus point, focal point uh, situated along that skeleton. So if we now move to R3, you have to calculate the skeleton of this particular region, and this time it's not circles anymore, it's spheres. <laughs> It has to touch the boundary in at least three points. And using that definition, you can calculate the skeleton that turns out to be something like this. So now you know where to focus the laser beam. The laser beam will have to be focused along those skeletal parts, because that's where it will, and then you have to determine exactly what point so that it covers those maximum, the spheres. The spheres' centers will be centered along that skeleton region. So that's a very important theory to have, right? So uh, let me make a long story short and kind of go through this very quickly. Uh, in three dimensions, you have this more technical definition. You have to make sure there are three points that it touches on the boundary. And you take that particular definition, you pull a few theorems. Uh, if, for example, a simple example of a cone is that if the skeleton region is that thing in the middle. In the middle. Um, and if you try to calculate the skeleton of a bench, you get the plane. So keep in mind that 
the skeleton is always one dimension less than what you started with. So if I'm in three dimensions, uh, the skeleton is going to be two dimensions. So this is an edge, uh, this is a point between the two plates, half length, and that's the skeleton of that. A more complicated example, the skeleton of a pair of pipes, which will uh, kind of tally with the rectangular example that I gave. Yeah, it could be two or less. It should be two or less, yes, absolutely, yes. It could be two or less. And in the case of this parallel pipe, you can see now the skeleton of the box are those plates, these sheets. Right? It, it actually tallies with our intuitive notion of the skeleton. You know, when, it, when you try to uh, flatten the box, for example, you take out the flaps, you kind of, you know, you can see that somehow the structure of the of the thing is exactly along these concepts. It's it's kind of being held together by these plates, as it were. Okay, so that's uh, these are simple examples. Um, when we come to our surgery. You have to keep in mind that once you put in one treatment, the shape of the region has changed. And now you have to recalculate the skeleton after every treatment. So you do this with a computer algorithm, and that's how it, it's, it's an iterative procedure. And then you show that uh, the greedy algorithm actually works. So yeah, the greedy algorithm is basically you have this tumor, irregular shape. You try to pack the largest sphere first. Do that, get it out, and now the, the shape is remaining. You try and fit the next uh, larger sphere. But of course, there are these constraints about what are the sizes of the spheres, which are the helmets that you have. There are other boundaries. But that algorithm actually works, and it turns out that in these regions, for example, uh, this is the kind of packing problem that it leads to. So let me summarize what I've said. I think I'm still out of time. GPS uses spherical geometry discovered 2,000 years ago. It uses relativity, actually, also, because there's some relativistic problems that arise with respect to time. And, uh, so the, uh, the uh, satellite in space has an atomic clock to keep track of its time. Because the GPS unit has a very cheap clock. So there's some problems with relativity that has to be Google uses the theory of Markov chains discovered 200 years ago. <clears throat> Gamma light radio surgery uses differential geometry to cover about 100 years. So this is all pure mathematics, no question about it, that's being used as well. The mathematics is pure, and, and when it was discovered, it was motivated by aesthetic considerations. Remember that quotation of Austin Dublin at the very beginning saying mathematics is an art form. And I think most of us do mathematics motivated by aesthetics. Where am I is the first question. What is important is the second question, or what is the shape? So these three questions, difficult as they are, were answered mathematically. <clears throat> and indeed, you know, there's room for what is important. You can try to redefine what is important, and therefore, uh, perhaps, refine movement. There's a lot of work to be done there. <clears throat> so here are some good references. You want to say the band of Christian Rosso. <laughs> mathematics and technology, which I would recommend you read, and there's a nice book on Google search engines. Uh, the $25 billion eigenvector article that I talked about appeared in the side of the in 2006. So these are three things that undergraduate <coughs> JR and in the room can certainly understand and read and see these books in the mathematics. Now, what, <coughs> let me give you a little bit of mathematical genealogy here. It's uh, one of my great heroes of mathematics. Yes, a great hero of statistics as well, Chebyshev, who, whose student was Markov. Markov was Chebyshev's student, and <clears throat> who was interested in actually in continued fractions. That's how Markov changed that discovery. He was trying to understand continued fractions. He wasn't trying to solve the problem of how diseases propagate, or how populations move, or how can I create a new search engine? <laughs> And Markov had a, had a student by the name of Tamar Ken, who was, so you may know, he ended up at Brown University. And Tamar Ken um, had a student by the name of Lamer. Lamer had a student, Carol Stark. Carol Stark had yours truly. So this is my connection to 
Chechev and Marco. So thank you for your attention here at the Final Cartoon for the world. I looked up your business on Google. If you want a second opinion, I can check that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I would say practically almost. Uh, the skull probably would. Yes. Probably. But this is a motion. But the idea of trying to understand a shape through a skeleton is a good one. Obviously, human blood is all that. Uh, where to place this beard is probably um, a question of what the vertices of the skeleton are. Yeah, those, those points. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. I said that. I said that the laser beam has to be focused along a certain radio, uh, you know, center of the sphere. It's going to be along those skeletons, right? So it has to be aimed at one of those points. And that has to be also determined from the packing. So where is that? Yeah. Yes, this is the Well, these things that uh, have applications, I mean, for people, sometimes find funny applications, don't they? It might, it might come to a point where you have to use it. Are there more other questions? Let's have a bit on the table. I have a five minute break, uh, and we have some good ideas. Thank <laughs> you.